This week on the Markcast, we're talking USFL stuff. Do you guys want to hear about USFL stuff? Is that what they want to hear about, Reed? Well, I think there's an identity crisis here going. I don't know. You know, we're... USFL is becoming a thing. I don't know if it's what people are wanting it to be or not. Uh, so we are discussing that. The announcement is coming uh, supposedly next week. Fox agents are going to be, you know, on the on the grounds uh, in Birmingham, kind of making the announcement about this spring alternative league. That's very cool news that we got coming up. Also, uh, Reed's got a sneaky thing to tell you all about here in a bit, but we're going to cover CFL like we always do. Uh, Argonauts clinching a playoff spot. Congrats to my team. Uh, looking forward to seeing if if maybe Montreal or Hamilton will clinch one this week. Yeah, we have a loaded lineup. We have Sean Bowen, a Toronto Argonauts digital and in stadium host. It's important building a culture here, a winning culture, and establishing these guys back in the community as being heroes and and you know spotlighting what a great product the CFL is that sometimes people don't really know of. We have. Simon Staliki, he is with TSN 690. I thought Schultz was good when he came in because I think, you know, there was enough athleticism there that on second and four, him getting out of the pocket. Uh, you know, Vernon as well, second and four is always that option to get outside the pocket and, you know, make a defender miss and pick up a first down. We'll see what Trevor Harris can do from the pocket. It's a good group, though. Like, it's a good, it's, I, I don't know if it's good, it's an excellent group of receivers. So guys should be able to thrive. Your quarterback should be able to thrive. You're now, am I putting that on the offensive coordinator? I don't know. And then we have Ethan Reddy. We're talking the little America CFL team, the BC Lions, yeah. kind of that confusing loss to the Argos. They're going up against uh, Hamilton. I don't feel great about that matchup, but that is uh, what is on slate for the Lions this week. That's a ball that he completes day after day in practice. Uh, that's a ball he needs to be making. And then especially a quarterback with, with the experience that he has, you need to be making that pass. It's going to be interesting to see. And we're going to also talk about a little bit of Major League Football news coming out. Apparently, there's a team and and fan-controlled football. Apparently, they tweeted out some something. And there, there's something going on with them, too. You have to tune in this week for all of the news and updates right here on the podcast. Yeah. I gotta fade that down a little bit better. I keep saying that every week and I'm gonna fade it down better, and I just never get around to fading it down better. It is what it is. It's good. Welcome to the show. I wanted to ask what are your thoughts on the Toronto Raptors as a Canadian NFL mascot? I was watching 20 years ago today, I guess the Raptors debuted. Did that 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 three for a loop? Yeah, I was like, what? They were <laughs> What? Yeah, 1995. I was just watching on Twitter. I was exporting my wedding video. I thought it, it just, you know, we have the Blue Bombers, we have the Alouettes and Amandos NBA, but Toronto Raptors. I just think that that's true. And then, you know, you know, when Montreal lost their baseball team, uh, Yupi, their mascot, became, you know, only for the Canadian hockey, the Canadians, the hockey team. Are you in a, is this as a baseball fan, are we in a good mood or a bad mood with the Atlanta Braves? We're in a very good mood. Um, you know, you got to stop with the chop, though. Yes. yes that being yes. said, uh, I'm glad the Astros didn't win. They're still in search for their first real legitimate world title. Um, I'm really happy about that. So, I mean, they could sit there and they could say, oh, well, we got 2017. The only reason they still have 2017 is because Major League Baseball would have had to take 2018 away from the Red Sox, and they didn't want to have a ch- you know no champions for two years in a row. That's the only reason the Astros were allowed to keep that title. The only reason. Lots of cheering at the bar trivia last night when the Astros got thrown, you know, <laughs> when they got thrown out of the first. It was exciting. But, uh, so we have a good show tonight. Uh, we are talking about the new USFL's identity crisis. Obviously, we're going to leave with CFL and stuff, but the announcement is coming uh, soon for that. We'll talk about it later in the show. I believe November 15th, that week. Uh, I've heard mixed. I've heard next week, and I've heard the week of the 15th, Fox officials are going to be in Birmingham to make that announcement. Uh, they're going to vote today as this airs to kind of finalize everything. So hopefully, fingers crossed, there won't be like an official announcement until next week when we can record again. Yep. Looking forward to that. Uh, see what's going on with that. I wanna, and I did, I did want to thank you, Paul, for, uh, you gave me a little pep talk this week. I, I wanted to thank you. And I, uh, listeners of the show, if you would have thought between Paul and I that Paul would have been the one to like keep on keeping on pep talk to read about this podcast, you, uh, probably the bets were off. So I want to thank you for that, Paul. That made me feel nice. Yeah. I mean, just, we just got to keep our nose focused on what we're doing. We're doing the right things. I just, you know, I don't care what 
everyone else is doing. I care what we're doing. That's why that's it's I always Pops always tells me this. He says this, lives and dies by it. He says the reason why horses in a race wear blinders is that they don't see the other horses running. Run your own race. So uh, anyway, thank you for that. Uh, please like and subscribe, you know, as, especially as we kind of get to the, all this USFL stuff coming out. A good CFL show today. We have uh, Sean uh, Bowen. I misspelled that name in the right now, but Sean Bowen, he is kind of the, the Robert McGregor we had on a couple weeks ago. He was with the Argos, your team. He's their digital host, stadium host. We talk a lot about that. Simon Staliki. Greek last name. I worked with him about trying to pronounce that. He is from TSN 690. And then we have Ethan Reddy. Ethan is a reporter, kind of like us. He's a, a local news reporter in BC, in uh, CKPG. He covers the lines. Uh, Ethan comes in with a lot of hot takes. I like Ethan a lot, uh, you know, questioning some of the decisions from the big Argos BC Lions game. Uh, also, like Ethan retweeted the episode before he's even been on it. That's always a good. Uh, uh, way to ensure that you get back asked back on the podcast. I believe Sean and Ethan have already retweeted the teasers for the episode. So a uh, good job then, but it's a, it's a good show. That's good. Um, yeah, we got some, it looks like we have some, uh, some, Oh, you know, this thing. I remember that. I'm, I now I remember what this was. Yeah. Okay. That kind of threw me for a loop. And then I'm like, wait, Reed did something very funny. I did do something very funny. People that follow me on Twitter will know this. There was a lot of discussion last week or the week before about, because the National Spring Football League is the LLC owned by Fox that owns the USFL. And there had been a lot of uh, misreports out there that said uh, perhaps the league would be called the NSFL and not the USFL. And that, you know, for whatever reason, uh, was a cause of panic. So uh, I was going online with listener Seth, and I realized that the National Spring Football League isn't actually trademarked by anybody. And so uh, we went and did that. So uh, even Dorothy signed off on it. Dorothy thought it was very funny. I am now the owner of the merchandising rights for the NSFL. I have a United or a National Spring Football League hat coming you can also go to uh the markcast.com slash store or merch i think it is and buy a this is a national spring football league t-shirt so uh the hat is coming it should be here next week what, what do you think of my ploy to get back at, at mr b woods this is funny i love it i love you know i'm a big pe- i'm a big petty guy they call me petty paul over on the wheelhouse i'm a big petty guy so this is kind of like right up my alley when i saw that you did that i was like that's that's flipping genius i almost swore there that's how genius it was it almost got me to swear within the first few minutes of this podcast well so you know uh facebook just changed their company name to meta last week and now someone owns the trademark to meta and they pay them 20 million dollars so like needless to say at this now oh, no that- what happened yeah what happened was the i guess the charity that that him and his wife run bought the name oh. a long time ago. Oh, oh. So. Well, anyway, I, I'm just saying if National Spring Football League comes a knock in that this, the Mark house might be a no mas, uh, and we might be living the swimming in that mind. Anyway, uh, we're talking about USFL. Also, just a couple quick things I want to get to the show. Uh, I, I realized I was today years old when I realized that Roman Reigns, my least favorite wrestler of all time, uh, played for the worst CFL team of all time, the Edmonton, then Eskimos, now Elks. Did you have any idea? I, like, I, I knew that in the back of my head that Roman played CFL, but I guess I never put that together. I didn't know that which team he played for, but yeah, I knew he played CFL. Well, I knew it, that. It makes it, all the sense in the world to me now that, that, you know, I thank God every day I'm not an Edmonton Elks fan and that Roman Reigns, literally the worst wrestler in the past 40 years, probably of WWE, uh, plays for the Edmonton Eskimos. Okay. Now, now I'm not a big Roman Reigns fan, but you're not watching anything that he's doing on SmackDown and going, that's really, that's actually really good. I did. I, okay. Listener Kevin did, didn't really make me chuckle when I tweeted that. And he said, acknowledge Roman and the Edmonton Elks. <laughs> and I thought, Cause that, right. That's his big thing is like, acknowledge me, acknowledge me. Okay. I'm acknowledging him. Uh, mm-hmm. Anyway. And then you watched the BC game, crazy game this week. You know, we lost track of timeouts. It was called like the most exciting game of the year. I, I don't want to do too much like hot or uh, cold water on the fire but like i talked with ethan about this in our interview like to me a head coach miscounting the number of timeouts in the end of a playoff clinching um game i i leading to overtime is not the most exciting thing to me that's a little bit of negligence i completely agree with that i i uh, you know i was i was back and forth i i i I had some things i had to do but i watched some crazy catches going like in the middle like i texted you you were working i was like oh my gosh this catch this bc guy made it was unbelievable they had some great highlights um but yeah i think their coach mismanaged the 
mismanaged the flow of the game. And it's like, man, you, you have to, you have to like get at least one first down, bro, get at at least one first down and they won't ever get the ball back. And then, you know, that's what happened. They got the ball back and tied it with, you know, the one point nonsense. I don't like that. I don't like that. I'm not going to like that. I'm never going to like that. Never going to get around to that. So, well, people, that would be people argued for the Rouge because of all that. Anyway, uh, so yeah, you know, BC lost again. Uh, Stamps won. Uh, Tie Cats ruled over the Elks, and then a uh, pretty competitive. You know, Rough Riders going over the Alouettes. Uh, it seems like Cody. We'll talk about him later in the show with our updates about our big, uh, you know, goof we did with uh, Cody. Uh, but yeah, Rough Riders are really good. Uh, we we preview the Argos game this week with Sean. We preview the Lions game with Ethan. Um, Rough Riders back at the Elks again, one of those repeats. And then Alouettes have a really tough match on Saturday against the Blue Bombers. So we'll have to see how that goes. Very cool stuff. Um, moving on, though. Moving on. Moving on. Uh, there's a new starter in town for the Alouettes, Trevor Harris. Yeah, so he's going to start. You know, he he. Uh, they were still going with Schiltz last week. Schiltz got pulled. Uh, Trevor Harris came in. Uh, I talk about this with Simon as well. Uh, Simon, obviously from the Montreal market, talking a lot about you know Alouettes are still really trying to make a push for the playoffs right now. Uh, you know, this isn't like a backup coming in and playing on a team that they've been at the backup of all season. This is you know a new quarterback coming in and and kind of taking the reins. And Trevor Harris is a very different quarterback than Vernon uh, Adams or. Ian even Matthew Schultz. And it's interesting to see how he's going to do, but you know, they're certainly paying him enough money uh, and he's got enough on his contract to kind of keep that going. So it's, it's interesting that they're, they're in the playoff hunt and then they decided to go get a quarterback on top of they're already in the playoff hunt. They're, they're in good position and they went ahead and got a quarterback. It's an upgrade. Uh, You know, it wouldn't surprise me. It wouldn't surprise me if Montreal made a move and ended up playing Winnipeg in the, uh, the, the gray cup. That's yeah. my prediction. Well, see, I mean, you know, Vernon's out right now. Yeah, I, I, the, you know, it's all, it's always that weird six game window. I don't know when that, you know, if he's gonna. I, I think he's probably kind of out for the season at this point. Uh, it was kind of for the Trevor Harris thing, but it, it it is just weird where you know, like Zach Calaris came in before back up, you know, took him to the Grey Cup just to bring in, you know, the, the cross country trade, you know, here in the in the midst of the playoffs and kind of getting that going. So. Yep. Uh, interesting to see if that'll that'll keep their momentum going. Um, hopefully it doesn't, because you know I prefer Toronto. Uh, went out there and get that first round by uh, the Edmonton Elks signing quarterback Nick Arbuckle to a contract extension. Um, he was on a one year agreement, and now they got him for another year on top of that. Yeah, so that you know, he obviously was traded from the Argos last week. You know, with McLeod kind of being anointed the face of the of the team there, uh, they've already signed him. He's going to be making three hundred forty thousand next year. Uh, the the thing with that though is the CFL really is year to year, so they really could tear this all up before like they get to come February next year and be like, actually, we don't. It's such a tenuous way the way this the contracts work there, but it is a vote of confidence that um, they are behind um, Arbuckle, kind of moving forward, hopefully trying to get you know, a new face of that franchise going. Uh, interesting enough though, Taylor Cornelius starting this week uh, against um, the uh, Saskatchewan Rough Riders. It is interesting. Yeah. That was courtesy of Dave Campbell. Uh, you know, they said that Taylor Cornelius is going to be starting. Arbuckle did limited work during practice, mostly observing. He's been saying like, again, it's one of those, like, this isn't a backup coming in. You know, this is we're we're moving him in. We're bringing him into the system. Uh, Cornelius has not played great, you know, as of late, obviously they lost uh, again. Um, you know, last week. So it, it, I think sooner than later, our buckle's going to come in. But uh, yeah, in the meantime, is people thought that was very strange that um, Taylor Cornelius is still getting the start. I think that I think it's just, they're just trying to get our buckle up to speed. Probably, you know, our buckles, you know, had had a little bit of time off, so maybe it's just you know getting the the offense under his under his feet and, and getting back up to speed on that. Uh, this was interesting. I thought I the minute I was watching the BC Lions game, I thought, oh boy, oh boy. Jimmy Camacho's in trouble. You, when you're in a league, when you're playing uh, pro football and you're a kicker and you start missing the way Jimmy Camacho is missing, your, your days are numbered. And with that being said, the BC Lions have signed uh, Nick Vogel out of the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Yeah, you know, BC already had the whole uh, uh, Takasaki, uh, Tamasaki uh, global kicker. That Remember, they started the season. He was the first Japanese kicker that kicked a field goal. Uh, you know, obviously let him go and then brought in Camacho that was thought to have kind of solved all their problems. Uh, terrible. I mean, you can't miss. One, he got win, win one for six over his last tries, over his last three games. I mean, you just can't do that. So uh, he, Nick Vogel, still in quarantine this week, obviously moving up to Canada. But this is, I mean, 
let, let's be honest here. This isn't going to fix all these <laughs> problems, but this is like, okay, we can check one of 18. <laughs> Someone tweeted, they're like, you know, except for the quarterback issues and the O-line issues and the defense issues and the kicking issues, like uh, BC has a really strong contendership for the Grey Cup. And I was like, that's kind of true. Kind of sad. If, if grandma had, then we call her grandpa. That's the way I look at things like that. Um, it, it is interesting that if Jimmy Camacho had made like one of those kicks, it would have never gone in overtime. I know. Just one. I know. Just one. I know. Uh, the team they lost to, the Argos, uh, announced today they signed American l- linebacker Nate Hawley. And um, Jonathan Zamora was also claimed off the uh, practice roster from the Stampeders. Hawley uh, was, uh, is 26. He had an outstanding 2019 campaign with the Stampeders, playing in all 18 games. Uh, he is also the twin of former XFLer Nick Hawley. Yeah, that's exciting. You know, Nick played for the Revnex. Uh, Holly, uh, Nate Holly is a former, uh, most outstanding, uh, rookie award. Uh, you know, he, he's a beast. Uh, you know, Argos clearly making a run at it here, right? Clearly trying to kind of booster that team together. Uh, but yeah, I always think that's cool too. Like I, I know the Nick Holly name. He was a big fan favorite in the XFL as well. Uh, they're like identical twin brothers. It's really crazy. Very cool. Uh, Andrew Harris, not cool news though. Andrew Harris missing practice Tuesday due to lingering knee injury. Um, the star running back uh, suffered the injury during the uh, Week 11 victory over the Elks, um, and he missed the uh, Blue Bombers' 45-0 win over the BC Lions. And, uh, yeah, uh, Winnipeg's already cl- claimed first place, so, you know, it's kind of like they're just kind of, you know, holding on to that and, and just, you know, they don't really have to play all their starters all the time, and it's probably a good idea to kind of get some other get some other faces, some game situations, some, uh, some up-to-speed on, on in-game situations, and then – you know, they get deeper when those those backup players start getting real world, real game experience. Yeah, it's one of those things, you know, they have Brady Oliveira as well. You know, he's a not obviously the the, rookie, the rock star of the Andrew Harris is. You know, he can certainly carry the weight. It's kind of like the Kansas City thing last year where they're like, we're, we're not going to play Mahomes for like the last two weeks of the season. Like, we've already got first place. Uh, the other just quick notes here, uh, Saskatchewan's having some injuries. Kyra Moore just came out this evening. He's probably out for the rest of the season. He was nursing a knee injury. Uh, uh, Murray McCormick was reporting that the Duke Williams, who remember they brought him in as kind of like the Cody Fajardo that was mad and they brought him in to bolster the wide receivers. Uh, he has a lower body and then Dan Clark, but that Kyron Moore, th- th- that's a lot of uh, damage to, to Saskatchewan this week when they're still very much in that West contention. I mean, they're, they're second in the West, so that's clearly uh, going to put them in, in trouble. So uh, definitely, definitely uh, moving on. Um, we already talked about Nick Arbuckle signing the one-year extension. Um, just some notable, I guess, quarterbacks that are set to free, become free agents uh, besides Nick Ar- Arbuckle, who could become, a free agent because like Reed pointed out, you know, go, kind of goes year to year. Um, McLeod Bethel Thompson's becoming, could be a free agent. Zach Kolaris, Dominic Davis, uh, Dane Evans, Isaac Harker, Jake, Jake, uh, Jake Mayer. Mayor, Mayor. Mayor. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Jeremiah Masoli that no one cares about, uh, Sean McGuire and David Watford all becoming uh free agents after the year. Yeah, it's just crazy. I mean, I just put this on here. You know, Vernon Adams, right? He's locked in with Montreal. Uh, Taylor Cornelius. It just, it's so tenuous, this quarterback situation here, right? Where they, I talk about this with Simon in the interview as well. The CFL is such a quarterback driven league. And then you have all these guys playing in these one, you know, one off year deals, right? Like we can tear up the paperwork at the end of the season. It's not worth what the paper it's written on. Just, I, I just can't imagine trying to build any momentum at all. I mean, I've already heard that they've really only kept McLeod in Toronto just because they they were sour on Arbuckle and that they're going to be looking for someone new as soon as the season's done. I mean, I don't want to like call out Sean on the interview about that, right? Where he's the Argos host, but like I, I was reading down on three down today, the insider quotes, like, yeah, they, they're really not that into to, to McLeod either. Even when Dinwiddie is calling him the face of the franchise. So something's weird with Toronto with that. And then obviously just that seeing how many guys are going to be on the, on the chopping block, potentially at the end of the season, moving on. Very cool stuff. Um, Blue Bombers attendance from last week. What is your special note on that? Well, geez, you know, we commented about how uh, with pigs, uh, they were like the attendance was down. I got about a million comments saying that it was because the Jets were in town. I understand that uh, Winnipeg clinched the playoff berth with their win. Like at some point, you can't blame like other things going on around town. It's just one of those things. Like you know, if the Jets are playing, make CFL can't miss. Make Winnipeg a hot ticket. People have to choose. They shouldn't schedule them on the same dates. But uh, if they do, then the uh, different times they got to pick different times. Yeah. Uh, you see just a couple of tenants here, uh, or a viewership here. Viewership's down this week. We don't need to read all these numbers, but do you see how it's really been trending downward uh, it, over the course of the 12 weeks of the season? 
Yes, I am. Um, last, I mean, it's up from last week, but it's still down from, you know, week seven. Yeah, I mean, they kind of peaked in that 520, uh, 550 range. The total week 13 average for viewership was 429,000. You know, uh, I think that has to do with the quality of play, right? We talked about that last week. We talked about the product being entertaining, but uh, they, the six of the first seven weeks were over half a million, but the last half dozen weeks have all been under half a million viewers. That's not the momentum you want going into the playoffs. Very true. Uh, Alouettes and Tiger Cats can clinch playoff spots with wins this week. Uh, Montreal win or BC loss means Montreal clinches a playoff spot. A Hamilton winner tie means Hamilton clinches a playoff spot. And no team in the West can clinch a playoff spot this week. Sorry, Reed. There's no <laughs> chance for your BC Lions. I, I, I did see Matt Baker going back and forth with some fans. Like, well, technically, if like these five teams lose and we win every game, and like it's, I think it's a 19.2% chance that the BC Lions make the playoffs. <laughs> look, look. On July like 16th, when the All Star break happened, the Atlanta Braves had a 0.4% chance, 0.4%, not 1%, not 4%, 0.4% of winning the world series. Just saying. Is that true? Always. It's it's a ton percent true. Wow. Okay. Don't then. you wish you would have gone back in time and put money on the Braves to win? <laughs> Boy, yeah. That's Both true. odds would have been astronomical in your favor. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, you see your Toronto clinch, your Saskatchewan, Winnipeg, all that kind of stuff. But I just thought kind of getting the playoff picture. <laughs> it was good. All right. Uh, Stan Peters signing CFL all-star receiver, Reggie Begleton. Begleton. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess he was with the Packers in 2020. Um, he, uh, he was only on the practice roster after that one game, um, against the, uh, Atlanta Falcons and he was earning $185,000 a year. Hopefully he gets the same amount. Maybe probably not. People seem high on this. Uh, maybe he should be going back to green Bay right now, considering the week that they're having. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, Elks drew between eight and ten thousand uh, people on Friday. Uh, they say they say the dwindling attendance is a result of poor on-field product. No, nope, it's a result of the culture. There's a really bad culture in Edmonton. Here's the thing. I mean, like, so Terry Jones, he's a, I've tried to get him on the show. Uh, he's not like not a podcast guy. He wrote like, a, he's like, you need to literally fire everybody. You need to fire Elizondo. You need to fire Sutherland. You need to fire the owner. Like you need to get right. Like, they need to burn the entire franchise to the ground and bring it back. Well, because Roman Reigns played for him. That's why. <laughs> Uh, but you know, it, it is one of those things where Edmonton it, it, it has like a fifty six thousand per stadium, and when you're only like getting like eight thousand in there, it's like really cavernous. I just saw tonight they're doing like twenty nine dollar. You get like a two dollar hot dog with it. Kind of the thing we talked about Toronto doing last week. They have a uh, the the fan appreciation night is this Friday, and the joke is that there's going to be more Rough Rider fans in the crowd than Edmonton fans. They're also doing that fifty fifty where you can buy tickets, and then part of the money goes to charity and part of it, but uh, they're zero and six at home this season. Like, I mean, what what are you going to do to kind of incentivize people to get into the stadium? That's weird. You you think you know you had a year off football, you weren't able to see your your Canadian football teams play, and you're not going to the games. It's really weird. It's, it's really weird. weird. Uh, Red Blacks head coach Paul LaPolice claims he does not want the general manager's title along with uh, being the head coach. Much like uh, I think Mike Holmgren was that way in Seattle when he was there. Yeah. Um, basically. Uh, or was it Green Bay? Mike Holmgren was double like a GM and a coach for a while, but uh, the police doesn't have an interest in that. Um, he just said he just wasn't wasn't down. Well, they have the interim in place right now. That was the thought, right? Was maybe if they want to keep La Police in, you know, as the head coach, you know, bump him up, give him some of the hiring, you know, um, signing right uh, agency there as well. Uh, he kind of dissuaded that. that uh, kind of like when they asked. Um, Oh, uh, Mike Tomlin. They're like, oh, hey, are you going to USC or whatever? And he was like, no, absolutely not. Remember when he yelled at like the reporters last week when they asked him if he was taking the call? It's going to be Eric. It's going to be Eric ben- the enemy. that's going to get the head coaching job at USC. Well, that that's the person they need to hire. I would I would be down with that. I would be down with that. He's the right offensive co- uh, offensive coordinator for the uh, Kansas City Chiefs, right? Yep, that's exactly. Yeah. I mean, you know, like their offense outside of this year has been good. I would, if I were Eric B and me, I would have taken that call. I would have taken that call immediately. Cause like the chief's offense is not doing that great, no, but no. 
I digress. Um, per Steve Milton, this is just interesting. They were going to do the Hall of Fame. Obviously, last year they didn't do it, you know, because remember CFL didn't play last year. Uh, so they're going to do, they were going to do it all this year, the Grey Cup. They're going to uh, keep it and they're going to do a special event uh, later in the spring at Tim Hortons Field for all the 2020 and 2021 classes. Uh, I want to make sure I have this down written right that it's going to be 2022. Uh, yeah, Canadian Football Hall of Fame doors closed until 2022. Uh, sometime before the 2022 season begins next spring. So uh, the spectator is a ad. It's, a, it's one of those like locked websites. So I can't read the whole article, but anyway, Steve Millen's friend of the show. Very cool stuff. Uh, speaking of cool stuff, uh, writers, Cody Fajardo has been told never to apologize for an ugly offensive win, especially when it clinches a playoff spot. Uh, he said it was an ugly, ugly win offensively, but he's always been told not to apologize for it, especially when you clinch the playoffs. And uh, yeah, uh, they, they, they did that with the win over the Alouettes, even though they had like 243 yards. Yeah. Um, we're, you know, and they, I just wanted to talk. So, you know, we posted our big Cody joke on, you know, the cameo thing. Uh, Cody, I don't know if he's not on Twitter this week. We've tagged him about a bajillion times. If you're on Twitter, you know, at the Mark cast, Reed Johnson, my, uh, my verified account on there. I've been trying to tweet at Cody, but, uh, I said for every, uh, retweet it gets, Cody actually has a thing set up where you can donate and, and, uh, uh, plant like a hundred trees. So I want to do that. It's like 60 bucks Canadian, whatever to do that. But uh, give that video some love, give us some retweets. We're still waiting to hear back from Cody, you know, about our whole uh, Mark cast uh, uh, cameo run in. So. Very cool stuff. All right. We're going to take a break. Uh, Reed's going to talk to our guests. Come back. We've got USFL news, TSL news, and uh, maybe some fan controlled football. Is that what I'm seeing? And the MLFB update. We have an MLFB update. <laughs> a lot of alternative football news coming up right after the break. Well, we have Sean Bowen here today with the Argos. I really like this. So we had Robert McGregor on a couple of weeks ago with the Blue Bombers, right? Kind of stadium announcer, host person. I like getting these other team right related, you know, people on. Paul's an Argos fan. How are you doing today? I'm great, buddy. Thank you for the the warm introduction. You could have just said professional T-shirt thrower, but that's you know, I, I do I do appreciate yeah yeah you know bigging up the role for me. So yeah. It's good. And now I, I will say as a BC Lions fan, America CFL team, I don't like you too much right now after the whooping that you guys put on us last week. Uh, talk me through your experience of that game. I'm generally curious. It was cold. Um, it, standing out in the rain for three and a half hours is, is, isn't the greatest. You know, I, I always say there's a big difference between being cold and cold and wet. And that was cold and wet. But I mean, you know what? The game, I, I know we get a lot of slack in the city for not having the greatest of attendance. But to be honest with you, I, I, I thought Saturday's game against the Lions was probably our best home crowd of the year. Um, and the game, it, it lived up to the expectations, right? I mean, I'm a huge Mike Riley fan because Mike Riley has uh, his relationship with who I think is the greatest quarterback to ever play the game and the greatest quarterback that ever will play the game. And that's Mr. Aaron Rodgers. Um, so I'm, I've always been a big fan of Mike Riley and to kind of see him in person and just the way that he throws a ball, it's, it's phenomenal, but the game got a little hairy at the end, a little dicey. I don't think the way the team drew it up, but nonetheless, uh, a colleague of mine, Natea J, uh, he said, you know, a, a dirty win is still a win at the end of the day. And I, I'm a big believer and there's no pictures on game sheets. And if it says you scored more points than the other team, well, Hey, you scored more points than the other team and you got the win. Yeah, Nate was on last week, and he politely said that, you know, he goes, you know, Toronto doesn't have the most intense uh, home field advantage, right? But Wait, I got I to stop you there. You got to drop the last O. It's not Toronto. It's Toronto. Toronto. Gotta, see, this is the stuff you got to learn, right. my man. Well, and we were taught, uh, yeah, how to say Saskatchewan or, uh, all, all, you know, it's Saskatchewan. Uh, but, you know, he politely said that. But here you guys are, 5-0 and at home, right? Uh, building momentum. We have McLeod Bethel-Thompson. We're, you know, we stand McLeod here. You know, we had our big, called him the king of the CFL back in week two, and everyone made fun of us. And now, you know, look who's laughing now. So, uh what, what do you attribute that to just that weird home field advantage for that's not really a home field advantage, but you guys are killing it. it on, it's honestly a great question. Um, you know, and, and I think a lot of our wins at home, I mean, they haven't been by huge margins either. Right. I mean, we've really kind of cut it by our teeth at home and 
you know, I don't know. I, I think it certainly does have something to do with the familiarity of the of the of the stadium. And and I know like BMO Field is one of the only grass fields in the CFL too, right? Which the players love, um, as opposed to running on turf. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, like listen, we, we do have a strong fan group. Um Sometimes they might be scarce, but, you know, we do have our diehard supporters and they certainly do make it feel like if there's 20,000 people in that stadium. Uh, sometimes that doesn't reflect on television, but nonetheless, and, and I, you know, the, the proximity to where the players live um, and how close it is to the field, you know, it's, it's home cooking, right? I think everyone would rather be playing at home than being on the road. And, and it's, it's been great thus far, the fact that we're 5-0 and at home and we've really made BMO field a fortress because, you know, the first year that I took over, my first game was against the Hamilton Tiger Cats, and I think we got beat 64 to Cobb. And I, and that was my introduction to the CFL, and I was like, oh, boy, if this is going to be like this for this year, it's going to be a long year. And thank goodness we've been able to cover a win at every home game this year, so it makes my life a heck of a lot easier. Yeah, you know, we have stories this week about uh, Edmonton, you know, and, and just – future performances right at home. I mean, across the world, but it, it's really hard. You know, when we're talking about building fan base and driving gate sales and building interest and to be, you know, have zero wins at home for the season is, is really hard coming back. Right. Oh yeah. No kidding. Right. And uh, we do, I know the Argos do such a tremendous job at uh, trying to gauge interest here within the city and it, it's difficult, right? I mean, you know, especially in the summertime when the Toronto blue Jays are, you know, what they are here, uh, you've got Toronto FC and then, you know, we get into October, it, you know, the, the city of Toronto certainly does become a, uh, a Leafs hotbed and a Raptors hotbed. Right. So it's, we do kind of get second fiddle, but you know, last Saturday with the rain and the weather, I, it was our best crowd of the year. And I'm excited to see now that we've punched our ticket into the playoffs, here's hoping that we get that East final and we're able to pack that place to its capacity. And, and I mean, back in the day, you know, my, my old man used to, you know, do the, uh, the, the spotting for the Argos. And I remember going down as a kid and we used to play at the Rogers center where the, uh, the blue Jays currently play and it was packed, you know, and it was one of the hottest tickets in town. And I, I don't know what's happened over the last few years. Um, you know, where we really haven't been able to get those diehard fans back, but um, you know, the team now, I think people are taking notice uh, that we do have some pretty exciting players and, and Hey, we are undefeated at home and it's an opportunity to come down and have some fun and, uh, and, and see a really good football team take on, uh, take on another good football team. Yeah. I mean, winning certainly helps talk about just the momentum here that Toronto is building. I mean, it really does seem all signs are pointing up. Uh, I know, you know, we had that weird loss right to the Alouettes back before the, you know, the, the Arbuckle trade and all of that. Uh, yeah. but, but really, you know, top of the East, the East is, is super competitive this year, right? Talk about the success the team's finding. Uh, you know what? It, it's very strange. I mean, we, we spoke with, uh, with coach Ryan Din- Dinwiddie this afternoon. And we were talking about, you know, at the beginning of the year, everyone picked this team to finish last. You know, they said that their schedule is too tough to play. Um, you know, you, you got to go up against Hamilton a number of times. You're playing Winnipeg twice. Um, it, it's going to be a daunting task. But this team has looked at the schedule in its face and has said, okay, well, let, let us just play and let us do it. I mean, th- to be honest with you, I think the biggest turning point of the season was the second game against the year against Winnipeg at home when we beat them, right? I mean, still... Winnipeg's only loss is to this Toronto Argonauts team. Um, they've been dealt some pretty serious injuries along the way. Um, you know, a couple of American guys that I know that they were high on bringing in uh, at the beginning of the season. You know, Shane Ray, I think, was one of them. And, um, you know, Charleston Hughes as well, who's, who's suffered injuries. But this team hasn't missed a beat. You know, it's been next man up. And, and the one thing that I think has really surprised a lot of people within, like, the Argonauts community um, you know, has been the play of their younger wide receivers and Curly Gittens Jr. and, and Dejon Brissett uh, primarily, right? I mean, Curly, I think, has taken a huge step in his career and is, is slowly starting to become one of the top receivers in the CFL. Maybe the touchdowns aren't there yet, but at the same time, he is a reliable receiver. And I, I can't speak enough about DeVar Snails. I, I think he's one of the best in the league. I was super excited when they signed him. I'm a huge Notre Dame football fan. Um, so I remember watching DeVaris back when he was done in the, uh, you know, the Golden Dome. And, you know, I think Mac obviously give him all the credit in the world. I mean, it's it's been a very challenging few years for him, right? I mean, he sat behind Ricky Ray and then all of a sudden they bring in James Franklin. He was second fiddle to there. 
This year, Nick Arbuckle comes in. I think everyone kind of anointed Nick as being the number one guy in the future of the team. But Max said, no, I'm going to continue to play for this position. And, and I think Max has been great. I mean, he's given him a chance to win night in and night out. Yeah, we're talking about that and, and the leadership, right, in the locker room and, and the reaction that the players give him. Well, I, you know, Mac is such a tremendous human being, and, and he's such a well-spoken individual, and, and he just he loves the game of football. Um, you know, and when they traded Nick, I know Mac was quoted saying that this is probably one of the you know closest quarterback groups that he's been a part of in his career. You know, with him and Pipkin and and Arbuckle, and they were all pulling for each other too, which is great to see because it's. You know, in some situations, there's always going to be the number one guy and there's going to be the second guy who's, you know, the younger guy coming up. And and maybe there's going to be a little animosity because, he knows the younger guy is going to be taking his job and the old wily vets, you know, on the last, you know, few yards of his career. But, you know, he just said that all three of them have been extremely close and they're all pulling for each other. And 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 to be honest with you, I think Antonio Pipkin's really kind of been some of the glue that's in that uh, in that quarterback's room. And now that they've traded, you know, Nick to Edmonton, um, you know, they've really given Mac the keys of the Ferrari to drive. And, you know, it's going to be on him here to lead them to a potential great cup appearance and potentially capturing, um, you know, a great cup. I just think it would be so cool to have that story about McLeod Belton Thompson, you know, kind of fighting, getting that position, and then, you know, winning the East, right, at a minimum, and especially going to the Great Cup there. I mean, even looking at the schedule coming up, I mean, obviously, uh, Red Blacks, I, I you know, not, not too much uh, of a concern, hopefully, right? I mean, you know, and then you have the tie Those those are the, the Those are the trap games, you know? <laughs> I mean, you know, I, <laughs> weird things have happened, but, you know, Red Blacks, and then uh, tie Cats, and then Elks. I mean, it seems like it's a favorable as it can be scheduled here in the CFL uh, thoughts on kind of the remainder of the season. Yeah, it's, I mean, you would think that this Saturday would be a layup, right? I mean, I, 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 no, it, it's true though, right? I mean, you, you, you put your hands up and you're just like, well, you've seen stranger things in the world of sports, right? So, um, you know, you're going into Edmonton or excuse me, Ottawa, where it's been doom and gloom here this whole entire year, right? I mean, two wins for them on the season. Um, and they've given up just an abundant amount of points against. Um, that being said, they're still pro athletes. They're still being paid to play the game, and they're not going to go and roll over and let the you know the Argos come in and take a big win from them at home. So, it, I obviously expect Ottawa to be ferocious and and come out swinging and and wanting to prove to everyone that hey, they're still a good team in this league. I, I, I'm more excited for the game against Hamilton. I think for obvious reasons, our biggest rival. Um, and those are always great games at BMO Field when, uh, you know, the the, tire, the the Kitty Cat fans come up from Hamilton and, and wave their flags and try to make as much noise as we do. So that's always fun. But it, we, I, I asked Coach today just, you know, what takes priority here, winning the East or is it, you know, maybe getting the guy some rest? And, and he kind of, he tiptoed around it a little bit and didn't give me a firm answer. But I think that's one question that the coaching staff is going to have to you know, determine here, like, you know, if you win here against, um, you know, if you, if you win against Ottawa this, this weekend, then you're going up against Hamilton. And if you say you lose against Hamilton, I mean, what takes priority then in the last game of the year? Is it rest or is it, you know, trying to win the East and getting the buy into the finals? I think for me, it would be trying to get a buy and go to the finals. Cause you know, then you'll get the rest at the end of the day, but uh, it's going to be interesting. These are three tough games for this team. Thankfully, two of them are at home, which makes it even better. But I think the one big concern is is the the last game of the season when you play Hamilton Saturday and then you've got Edmonton on Tuesday. So you really got two days of rest and playing pro football I'm, on two days of rest is unheard of. You know, so that's I, I'm very curious to see how that shapes up. Yeah, I'm looking here. I mean, and this is where the Edmonton of it all comes in with all, all that, you know, where, and then the Edmonton's playing the, uh, the 16th and then the 19th again, you know, at BC, which is, you know, I mean, hopefully we, we might be able to get one more win before the end of the season. You know, if we can't beat Edmonton on three days rest at home, I don't know really what we're doing in this league. Yeah, those guys have a tough schedule, eh? I mean, with just, especially with COVID, it's like, at the end of the day, like you just you wonder like how safety is a concern there because that's a lot of football and this is a very physical game. Um, you know, you see the NFL doing it right when you're playing a Thursday. It's like you usually kind of get that late Sunday game the following week. It's, I mean, it's difficult. Uh, talk about are are you sensing? 
excitement in the community there with this growing, you know, winning and, and we're making moves and we're, you know, here we are potentially going into Hamilton, you know, to, to play Grey Cup? You know, I, I, I think the change of culture happened the season prior to the pandemic hitting, hitting us here. And when, you know, Ryan Dinwiddie was brought in and, you know, pinball was brought back in as a general manager and, and Murph, you know, being an advisor as well. I, I think the, you know, Bill Manning, who's the, the president of, uh, of the Toronto Argonauts. I mean, he said it, it, it's important building a culture here, a winning culture and establishing these guys back in the community as being heroes and, and, you know, spotlighting what a great product the CFL is that sometimes people don't really know of. Unfortunately, the pandemic, I think, has, has hurt the ability of the guys being in the community as much as they want to with, you know, restrictions here in Ontario. Um, but I mean, from the people that I speak with, man, on a daily basis, you know, whether it be at games or, you know, via Twitter or whatever, I mean, there's a growing sense that this team is doing something special and a lot of people are excited about it. I mean, I, I personally think we have some of the greatest fans in the CFL. They're very passionate and, you know, they're at every, there are a lot of them come to practice to watch, uh, they always hang around after the game, you know, whether it's a win or a loss to, you know, support the players. It's, I, I think once we, we get into playoffs, I think we're going to see a bit of a, a change in tide here with the, you know, fans coming back. But I mean, I'm excited, man, to say the least. Like, I, I think this is a very exciting team to watch. I think if they get healthy here within the next few weeks, I personally think it's, it's, it's going to be an exciting playoffs. I, I'm excited. Like you said before, you know, Winnipeg, the one loss they had was to the Argos. You know, it feels like a million years ago now, right? That, doesn't it? But, but to, to think then that, you know, maybe that we saw that one chink in the armor, right? I mean, it is just from a storytelling that would be cool to me to see that if, you know, <laughs> where everyone else has just been decimated. That was like the one, uh, yeah. they, you know, they say like, you know, the Russians been cut, right? Or like in Rocky, you know, like, you know, that they, they yeah. bleed. And so, uh, he's not a, he's not a, he's not a machine. He's not a machine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I, I, I'm excited for that. Uh, any other, like, you know, I, I, I hate like bearing on the Winnipeg thing, you know, winning, uh, thoughts on, on maybe the Alouettes making the move here at the end in, in the East seems like, you know, maybe they would be some competition. I, I certainly think they're going to be, I mean, Trevor Harris is a proven quarterback in this league, right? I mean, he's, you know, he, he's seen it and done it all. Um, and and that's and obviously right. I mean, you, with these three final remaining games, it's like you're either going to be playing, you know, Montreal or Hamilton. It looks like right. So, um, you know, good on the Alouettes for establishing that they needed a quarterback. Um, can Trevor Harris come in there in this short a period of time and really change? Perhaps. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I personally think it's going to come down to Toronto and Hamilton. If I had to put money on it, um, and I'll go as far as to say that I think we're gonna. Take out Hamilton. Uh, it will be excited. Uh, Sean, well, I, I appreciate you so much for taking the time today. I know it's you know, busy and news in the middle of the week and stuff, but I, I appreciate worries, you taking man. the time uh, building. You know, we had Josh Burton on, and now we've had uh, Nate on, and you. And so building kind of our repertoire of Argos people, I, I do appreciate it. Yeah, I'll, I'll bug Mike Hogan for you. You guys can pick his brain for a half hour. I'm sure he'd love to come on. No, Mike, Mike's been on. Mike's been on. Mike oh, has, has yeah, Mike has an invite to come back on uh, here in a couple of weeks to preview the finals, but he doesn't want to come on oh. unless the Argos are in it. So we have to hope that they're in it. He said, I will oh, not come okay. on uh, if the Argos aren't playing in the, in the finals. So I think I was, I was, I was just with him this morning, filming our keys to our game. So I'll, I'll, I'll bust his hump again to make sure he comes on. Yeah. I'm, okay. I'm sorry. You had to spend time with Mike Hogan. I'm sorry. Yeah, we'll do that. Uh, trust me, the, feel, the feelings are very mutual. It's it's a love hate relationship between him and I. I love him and he hates me. <laughs> uh, thank you so much again, and uh, good luck this weekend. It, it should be, you know, it's going to be exciting here. The last couple weeks here, we're getting near the end of the season. So, no worries, Reed. Thanks so much for having me, man. I appreciate it. Thanks. Well, I'm so excited today after now being properly taught to introduce our guest, Simon Talikis. From yes. TSN 690 Montreal. Simon, thank you so much for coming on. How are you? Oh, pleasure, man. Thanks for having me. So there's been, as I mute myself on here, turn it up. So there's been some kind of lamenting as we're approaching week 14 of the CFL. You know, are the games exciting? We talked about it last week. Three Down Nation did a big thing. Uh, Rob Vanstone. Been a lot. What has been your overall, um, you know, mile high view of the CFL this season? Um. 
uh, you got to get great quarterback play. And that's what I think has always made the CFL special. When you go back to like, I'm not going to call it the heyday of the Canadian Football League because I can only go back so far. But when there was a Jeff Garcia, when there was a Doug Flutie, when there was a Casey Printers and Anthony Calvillo, uh, right before him was Tracy Ham. That to me, I don't even know what era exactly that was. But, you know, Jeff Garcia went on to the NFL. Um, you know, Casey Printers was a pretty good player. He couldn't, you know, I think he tried to, to get on with Kansas City, but he didn't. But there was a lot of talent at the quarterback position in the Canadian Football League. And that's what I made it. I I think it made it really special. And right now, I don't want to knock the guys that are there, but it seems like we have the haves and the have-nots. That's the thing. Uh, A healthy uh, Calgary team and a healthy Bo Levi Mitchell kind of changes things. But right now, if I can just be a little bit critical of some of the uh, Canadian Football League this year, is that we're not getting great quarterback play right across the board. But it goes with any league. Like, you go back to, like, maybe the... You know, uh, the 90s when the, the, there was a struggle in the National Football League when like Dave Brown was getting snaps with the New York Giants and whoever else was in the NFC, it just wasn't good. They made a conscious effort the last 10, 15 years to protect the quarterback in the NFL. I think in now quarterback, uh, they're upright. You can't hit them. That's too bad. I, you know, I, I prefer my football in any level when the star quarterbacks are playing. So I'm just going to say that, you know, a little bit more stability, a little better play from the quarterbacks. I, I think that the league would be healthier. It's just hard, you know. I mean, we and we were talking off, you know, camera before, you know, com- coming into this this season, and it's like, you know, this holy Graceland, this promise, right, of like this exciting football and everything, and and not that the games, and, and I think the storylines, right, the characters. I just had Sean Bowen on talking about McLeod Bethel Thompson, you know, kind of rise in in um, you know yeah. Toronto, but you know. They said after Labor Day, the games pick up. Obviously, the the schedule pushed that back. But it's like we're still not. And now I've heard you know. What, oh, well, once we hit playoffs, then it's really. Good. I'm like, but it's still the. <laughs> you, you're going to tell me that you know Winnipeg, Montreal, Week 14 versus Week 16 is going to be that dynamically different because it's the playoffs. It won't. It won't. I think what you see, what you get. Uh, there's also look. There's an, also an element there in the, na- the last couple of years, especially with COVID, the National Football League has expanded its rosters. Uh, and that means there's probably more quarterbacks out there on practice rosters rather than they're been wanting to take reps in the Canadian Football League. That hurts them as well. I remember having this uh, conversation with Nick Lewis about, you know, I was asking him what he was going to do post his football career. And he was talking about a high school coaching job that was like, a very nice salary, a very nice living. So that's what they're always competing against. I just think, you know, I love the Canadian Football League when the quarterbacks are a little bit more like Doug Flutie, like uh, when they're a uh, Damon Allen type, where you can get outside the pocket and you get creative, you can run rather than just the guys that are going to sit that back there and try to dissect a defense. So you, you maybe, you know, you hope that catches on maybe a little bit. Guys south that maybe need to polish their game uh, be better throwers. They, they come up here for a little bit because look, like Jeff Garcia used the, the CFL as a stepping stone. So did Doug Flutie. So you know a lot of the, the good quarterbacks. So just get a little bit more athletic back there rather than the guys that are. Because to me, the league's never been a you know five step drop, seven step drop, sit back there and dissect the defense. Although I thoroughly enjoyed the Anthony Calvillo uh, days and the eight hundred winning percentage that came along with it. But from a viewing perspective, I've always felt that. That was the. That's what made the CFL special. A little bit more dynamic. It's just hard, you know. We I, we produce this show. I do this show every week, and you know, we it, it's like we preview these games and we talk about what could be, and then and then sometimes we see the games, and it's like. Ah, uh, you know, it, it almost feels like, it, and I see the same in a lot of the Facebook groups and the message boards I'm part of is, is the, the community, right? The fans that want to support the league, uh, the conversations around the league are sometimes more exciting than maybe the games themselves are. Yeah, it, it is sometimes. Look, I think you also got to remember one thing. Um, when the Owls are struggling, which they're not, I think last time I checked, they're above 500. They're a good team. They'll make a playoff spot and all that. Um, When the Argos are good, too, uh, I think that brings more media and I think it brings a larger fan base in. But right now, like the CFL is always going to excel in Calgary, Edmonton, Saskatchewan and Winnipeg. I think Ottawa's got a nice thing going on, a little bit more of that hometown feel, smaller market. But kind of like I would say uh, maybe like how the Packers are, you know, it's a it's a it's a very good market. It's a very healthy market, but it doesn't have the 
the reach of uh, the Cowboys or you know the Steelers market. But it's a, I think Ottawa is a very good market. So you need, I think, Montreal to be a little bit better. You need the Argos for the good of the game. Uh, you need the Argos to be better. You need that fan base to come in, and then I think you'll get a little bit more. Uh, look, you get a little bit more exposure, a little bit more coverage, and I think that helps the game as well. Uh, we've talked this week about just the oversaturation, right, of content, right, of sports. You know, here we are. You know, NHL is you know has launched now. Uh, you know, NFL is in full swing, and, and how much that that year off really hurt the CFL, right, in terms of not only the visibility, but then obviously coming back now, if the quality of play right now is to blame for the year off, or the, if the year off is to blame for the quality of play now, then then it was doubly bad, right, in terms of the, uh, not going forward with that. You know, thoughts on that and just kind of the CFL trying to maintain some sort of uh, market share? I think you're right about that. I, I You know, I don't think the, the Canadian Football League is, you know, he- not, I shouldn't say healthy enough, because there are areas, again, that are very healthy, but yeah, taking the time off and losing a little bit of that talent, you don't make enough money to sit there and miss that pay, right? Like for the guys that are fringe players or, or not stars, they got to find something else to do. And and the one year off, I'm sure a lot of guys went and found something else to do, whether it was a coaching gig and, and, uh, and, and didn't come back. Uh, another thing I'd like to see, I wish the revenues are greater so that they can pay their assistant coaches better. And I think once you get a little bit more continuity with, you get OCs and DCs that want to stick around and, you know, you bring in a young quarterback and then next thing you know, OC has gone because he got a, a job somewhere else because he's made a, he made an extra buck and stuff like that. So the root is the problem is always the money. And if there was a little bit more money to go around, I think guys south of the border would give it a shot. Any Canadian football player that I've ever interviewed at TSN 690, we brought, I've brought in Devere Posey a couple of times. Gino Lewis, we brought in a few times. Like Gino Lewis has been, teammates with Saquon Barkley and Baker Mayfield. Pretty impressive to me. It's a Heisman Trophy winner, first pick overall, a second pick. So he's got no problem up here. He played at Oklahoma. He played at Penn State. And, and, you know, and you want him to be an ambassador of the game, Nick Lewis, ambassador of the game. Once you get more guys to come up, and again, it has to do with dollars and cents, I think the product becomes a lot better as well. But I, I, there's that small element there that I believe if, if coaches were better compensated, I think you'd see a, a, even a better brand of football. But guys come, they try, they use it as a, you know, let, me, let, my, let my, myself get in there at the professional level and see where it goes from there. But if they can, it's worth it for them to stick around. I think that helps the game. Yeah, I mean, that's been a lot made too this season about, and, and I'm never going to be the X's and O's kind of guy, but just the offense and, and trying things, pushing the ball down the field just hasn't been there this year. It's a lot of, um, you know, kind of letting the defenses dictate, right? And just not... You know, you're going for that four yard pass. Okay, maybe you get it. You know, we're going to get the first down. But if you know, if you miss one, trying to put together twelve plays in a row to get down the field just isn't happening this year. The quality of play, right, just isn't there. Where with the three downs, if you miss the one play, you know, the whole drive's done. And, and you're trying to. I mean, are you just the monotonous of the game sometimes, right? The back and forth, the punting. I mean, what do you make of all that? It's tough. Listen, it's a different game. You're right. Um, you know, you set yourself up on second and tens in the NFL or college football. You, you give yourself a chance to still convert a first down. Or in, in the CFL, it gets a little bit more difficult. I'd like to see uh, teams push the, the ball down the field. I'd like to see uh, the Alouettes get a little bit more creative as well with their offense. At the beginning of the year when they were uh, struggling with uh, Vernon Davis, uh, Vernon Adams, excuse me, uh, when they were struggling with Vern Adams, I just felt that when I was watching them play, it's like, this is not what the CFL is supposed to be like, man. It's supposed to be four guys in motion, two guys splitting out of the backfield, going down the field, six guys, you know, six set receivers. That's what it's supposed to, to look like more. Now, how you can get that, again, I think is once you get more established quarterbacks and guys that are comfortable here, uh, I think it'll be a better, better brand in football. Look, the Alouettes have brought the running game back. It's that back. I like it. Uh, I still think there's a place in the Canadian Football League for running. You know, like it's a big field. You can run on on, on second and eight and, and have a pretty decent chance of getting a first down. So maybe some teams need to implement that more. Um, the return game is fantastic. I'm a big fan of the National Football League as well, but my biggest pet peeve, I always use it as an example. I have a buddy of mine, this going back like 20 years, uh, went to New York to watch the Cowboys and the Giants and Deion Sanders was playing for the Cowboys. So we're like, well, let's go 
prime time. We're going to watch prime time. This is awesome. We went to watch and pay. We paid an arm leg for, for the ticket, some ridiculous amount of money. The exchange was terrible as well. So it was, you know, double down. And we watched them. They punted the Dion five times. Fair caught four of them. I'm like, this is criminal. This is it's the one. It's criminal. I didn't sign up to see this guy hand it over to the official. So there's an element of the Canadian Football League that that is very good. I love the fact that they give the five yard rule. Uh, one thing I think all NFL fans can complain is that we're seeing way too many kickoffs go through right out the back of the end zone. We've lost the return. I'm a you know big Chicago Bears fan. Enjoyed Devin Hester and his days with the Bears and his return game. So there are the elements are there. Just need to get a little bit more playmaking, a little bit more creativity, especially on offense. What do you make of you know Trevor Harris now coming to Montreal? Right, you know Vernon Adams, you know down with injury, right? Presumably, you know through the season, uh, trying to get you know wasn't getting success really in Edmonton. Now you know trying to get in this. It's like this quarterback carousel, right? Where, you know Arbuckle's moving and Harris is moving. But do you think he's gonna? He's starting this weekend, right? You know Matthew Schultz uh, got pulled last week. So what do you make of his chances for success in, in Montreal? Uh, I don't know. It, it's tough. I haven't seen enough of him, you know, how it tailed off. Uh, but, you know, I, I thought Schultz was good when he came in because, I think you know, there was enough athleticism there that on second and four, him getting out of the pocket. Uh, if, you know, Vernon as well, second and four is always that option to get outside the pocket and, you know, make a defender miss and pick up a first down. We'll see what Trevor Harris can do from the pocket. It's a good group, though. Like, it's a good – It's I, I don't know if it's good. It's an excellent group of receivers – so guys should be able to thrive. Your quarterback should be able to thrive. You're now, am I putting that on the offensive coordinator? I don't know. But Stanback is the best running back in the league by a mile. I think he, uh, Eugene Lewis is the best wide receiver in the league by a mile. And if he isn't, his stats will back it up. He leads in pretty much every major category. Winicky and Cunningham are very good as well. So the weapons are there. So at some point, you know, is it the quarterback? Is it the OC? It's going to fall on those two guys. You know, you can say what you want about the O line. Okay, there's there's ways to, to patch up an O line, bring in an extra receiver, keep your back in, in there to to help out with some of the blocking assignments. So the talent on offense is there. They should be able to move the sticks a lot easier. Trevor Harris gonna get that opportunity. Uh maybe they need somebody a little bit more of a veteran presence. I don't know. Uh, but I didn't hate what the Shields brought. I just thought that he was pressed in and it's hard to make it work right away. But that group's a, a good group of wide receivers. Is it fair? And I'm not obviously, you know, coming into the CFL, the, the, the longest term Trevor Harris fan, but quite a different QB style, right? Than Vernon Adams, right? I mean, y- you have this offense built around Vernon Adams and Matthew Schultz, right? You talk a little more, right? Isn't Trevor Harris a little more, you know, we got the accuracy, right? And the, and the throwing versus you know, uh, Vernon being able to scramble a little more. Yeah. Look, the, to me, when they acquired uh, Vernon, I thought it was a home run. I'm like, this is it. This is exact. Unless, you ha- unless you're blessed by the CFL gods that you get a guy like Anthony Calvillo and you get him the group of wide receivers that he had and a lot of the homegrown talent that he had on the O-line, that, that Alouette's team for a decade was a special group. They won a lot of football games and they were good at every level. But that doesn't come around often enough. I think you have to be athletic uh, when you play quarterback in the CFL. And when they signed a Vernon, I thought it was a home run. Like I, I watched him in, in college. He can get outside the pocket. He's a Pretty decent arm. It should have worked. It hasn't worked the success rate that I thought, but you know, being off from football for him for a year from COVID, I don't think that helps him. I think that's you know, if you look across the league, who's a quarterback that didn't need the reps or could have used the year off? Probably Zach Calaros. He's pretty banged up. He's having a great year. Bo Levi's another guy could could have used the year off. Not Vernon. Vernon needed those reps. So I think uh, when you look around the league. Whether it's hockey, whether it's uh, you know basketball, everybody got that time off or whatever. Who did it hurt the most? Probably in the Canadian Football League, nobody was hurt more from the, the shutdown than Vernon. He was getting into his group. He was getting an opportunity, also getting an opportunity on a team that wasn't good, but he was going to get his reps. So they could have went five and whatever or six and whatever. Alouette's fans wouldn't have cared. Well, they would have cared, but if they would have seen progression with their quarterback and known that that's the guy going forward, uh, I think they would have been fine with that. And I still think he's the guy going forward because, t- to me, his his DNA makes uh, should make a very good CFL quarterback. Uh, you know, you're a radio host, right? You know, you talk sports all the time. A- have you talked more CFL right now in the last 20 minutes than you have in the last couple weeks? Not me, but others maybe. Yeah, if you brought some, I like. Listen, I love football. 
Um, I try to do, um, whenever I'm hosting, I probably uh, push uh, the football more than anybody. I, I think I definitely push the basketball uh, more than anybody. I've been there for about, I'd say, 15, 16 years. Um, I was doing basketball when it wasn't cool and trendy, when we were getting uh, you know, text messages from listeners, almost threats to stop talking about basketball. That's not the case anymore. Uh, but I, we, I, I do talk. I know when I'm on, I'll be on with Joey Alfieri at the end of the month. There, there'll definitely be a discussion about uh, CFO football on the daily. Look, you're in Montreal. I don't need to explain to you what drives the radio station, what sport drives the radio station. It's hot. It's hardcore. Uh, but I, I want to implement as much CFL uh, as I can and NFL at that as well. Yeah, I'm just trying to... We have, we have a, you know, we have a, the general manager is a regular contributor once a week on the drive show. Uh, the coach is a regular contributor on the morning show. We get a couple of the players here and there. So we do our best. We do our best to, to push the, the program. And I, yeah, and that's meant as I'm just trying to, you know, in terms of market interest, right? That's what I mean, right? It's not, you know, in terms of, uh, obviously we want the people to be passionate. I just don't know. Like, is, this, is this driving, you know, like uh, daily conversations in Montreal here? You know, as we approach playoffs, as we approach, you know, this culmination of the season, we're finally back. That's where I'm trying to figure out, you know, because obviously in Seattle, I don't see talking talk all about this. <laughs> no, you know, it doesn't happen. Uh, I'm, I don't know if it drives, I don't think it drives conversation. Uh, I think if they're a playoff bound, people will listen. If there is a playoff game, they'll fill up. Uh, look, the uh, Alouettes are in a dogfight with CF Montreal. That's the MLS club. So depending on what the buzz is, uh, it look, it's Habs first. If they're competitive, they'll get a crowd. Uh, they're not good enough to be bad. But how many teams are in pro sports good enough to draw a crowd even when they're uh, terrible? Uh, I can't think of many. You know, like even NFL football teams like NFL, you know, they all, all, they all make this incredible amount of money. Okay, the Jags suck. Uh, they don't get a crowd. Other, you know, Cleveland for years wasn't that good. It didn't fill up. Uh, the Alouettes are a good talking point. People will show up, but they need to win football games. In terms of their chances here in the East, right? You know, Toronto's looking strong. Uh, you know, they, they seem like they have an easier schedule coming up, uh, you know, playing uh, Ottawa this week. And then I think it's Edmonton uh, the week after, uh, or, the, you know, the third week. Uh, chances on, on Montreal making a, making a run in the playoffs? I think they can make a run in the playoffs. I think the next couple of weeks is tough. They get the Winnipeg, uh, which we haven't seen. And then there's a game against Saskatchewan. I think there's two against Winnipeg and one against Saskatchewan. So that's gonna, that's a tough stretch for them. I like that defense. They can get after the quarterback. Uh, there's some ball hawks on the defense as well. And I think, look, if they can get any continuity and they can find their guy between now and the end of the season, I don't care. Uh, if you can stay away from Winnipeg, to me, everybody else is beatable. Right now, it's, it's Winnipeg and everybody else. So if you can stay away from Winnipeg and whatever the matchup is, you got a pretty decent chance to uh, to win a game. Like I don't know if they're going to go in their head in favorites. I really doubt that, but I, I think they can win a football game. And again, I'm a big fan of all the weapons on offense. If they can get something out of the quarterback position, they could be fine. It's just tough, you know. It, you have the one thing, you know, the backup quarterback, you know, maybe comes in, makes the playoff run. You know, like Zach Caleros, right? Was the you know the like, but you know, bringing in Trevor Harris here, you know, like <laughs> fresh out of, it, it's just it, it would be a crazy story to see them really find success here, bringing in, you know the, the the shunned Edmonton quarterback that nobody wanted from the team that no one really cares about, you know, to be brought in uh, would be a remarkable story and something that I would be here for. Well, listen, the last time Trevor Harris played a playoff game in Montreal, I think he completed his first 22 passes in a row and finished the game 35 for 37. So if you can bring any of that to the next uh, Alouette's playoff game as a starting quarterback, they'll be okay. I remember that. It was just ridiculous. It was, and it was 20, I think he started off the game 22 in a row. And it wasn't like 22 dump off either. Like he was stretching the ball. So look, if they can get anything out of him, I think they'll be all right. Uh, last question before I let you go, just future looking here. You know, I've seen a lot of the attendance numbers come out. I've seen a lot of this, you know, the, the bills are going to come due at the end of the season, right. You know, in terms of attendance and money and things, uh, you know, long-term sustainability of everything here, you know, obviously, uh, we lived through all these XFL talks before and I don't want to, you know, say the M word again, but, uh, what are we thinking CFL going forward? Obviously they announced, you know, gray cups moving forward, but just the overall uh, health of the, of the league right now. I think it's good. Uh, I, I don't think it's great because when you have your, you know, 
because the, the Mark Vancouver, Toronto, and Montreal are the biggest cities in this country. Uh, they need healthy football teams. Uh, they need football teams that, you know, fill up. Like the Argos having 6,000, 10,000, whatever it is out of the game. That's not good. It's, the, it's like having, you know, the Yankees drawing 6,000 people. That's like you need your biggest markets to be represented. Uh, the CFL will be always be very, very healthy in the middle of the country with the four teams. Uh, you want to see BC do better. You want to see the Argos do better in the Alouettes. The Alouettes, I think, are on the cusp of, of getting really good, some really young talent there, new owners. Um, I, look, the CFL is going to be around for a lot. It's just, you know, what's the level of play? You know, how much, you know, how many guys can you get from down south to come play up here? More kids in Canada are playing basketball and football than ever. Uh, you know, Canadian kid got drafted in the second round to Washington in the National Football League. Teams are sending players down south. So, you know, same thing like we're looking at our Canadian, you know, men's basketball program where, you know, 20 years ago was made up of Steve Nash and maybe one other guy who got a cup of coffee in the NBA. Now the men's national program, there's guys who have pretty decent NBA careers who don't get the invite. They don't make the roster. That's how deep it is. The same thing with the soccer squad. Uh, and I think with football too. Um, I, I think there's more kids playing. I think there'll be more local talent, which will help the game as well. But, you know, the one thing I've always asked, I've been on the radio for 16 years. I've been watching the Canadian Football League for like 40 years. I'm still waiting for that great Canadian quarterback. We have a two-time uh, MVP in Steve Nash. We have uh, Alfonso Davies, who's tearing it up uh, all over the world in soccer. We're still waiting for the outstanding Canadian quarterback. It's uh, We've had, you know, elite tennis players. We've got a guy who won the Masters. For whatever reason, this country still has not produced uh, a high-end CFO quarterback, which is crazy. Well, I will, we'll, we'll keep track of it. Yeah. I mean, it, it, yeah, yeah, I know you hate to see that, you know, the, the Americans come up. I, I'd love to see, you know, like Nathan Rohr get more opportunities in BC here. You know, God knows what will happen with Michael Riley moving forward, but it would be nice to see some of the Michael Connor, right? He's with Calgary. Uh, some of these guys getting to start Jake Mayer, right? Am I making it up? So we'll see. Uh, Simon, thank you so much for sharing your time today. I appreciate finally connecting and getting you on and, uh, it should be good. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you. Well, we have Ethan Reddy here with uh, CKPG News out of BC. I'm so excited to have you on. We can talk a little America's CFL team, the BC Lions, and kind of week 14. Ethan, how are you doing today? I'm doing really well, actually. It's it's still dark outside here in Prince George, but uh, uh, you, you gave me a reason to wake up early and actually get out of bed. That's good. Yeah, that's it. Now, and I don't, so before we talked, you know, we prefaced kind of before we got on, you know, we're doing a little research to catch up on CFL, which I think is fair because I, I do think there's been a little bit of uh, lethargicness right now with some of the media, right, covering this. Have you found, um, you know, not as much excitement covering it? I mean, I think that's okay to say into the season. You know, it's tough because like, I mean, uh, a little bit about myself, but uh, CFL has always been a big part of, uh, of my life. It's part of the reason why I actually got into broadcasting, into journalism. Um, you know, I've worked for the Hamilton Tiger Cats as their staff writer. I worked in the CFL head office. Um, and this has always been a league that I have paid close attention to. Since moving out here in Prince George, being kind of that local sports guy uh, and paying attention to those local sports teams, it's not so much that this this season is any less exciting than any other one. And if anything, I think this is a very, very unique season, just given the circumstances, the shortened season and everything with that. Um, it's, it's more so just, I mean, my lifestyle has just got to a point where it, it, it's tough when, you know, you've got local sports teams playing Friday, Saturdays, and you simultaneously also have CFL going on. It, it can be tough to stay on top of what's going on. And much like yourself, you know, busy schedule, you're, you're having to watch these games after the fact, after everyone has already kind of reacted. Um, and perhaps in some, some cases it's, it's tough to have that organic, you know, unswayed opinion on how, how games are being played out. I, I think it's fair though, because you know, I, CFL obviously didn't play last year, right? And the assumption was always, you know, well, they're going to come back, you know, flip the lights back on. And it has been, there, there's a lot of other things to compete against attention wise right now, you know, sports and otherwise, right? You know, now we have NHL, right? I mean, good luck for me trying to get a lot of the CFL people that I'm used to talking to on the show, right? Just because, 
you really got to go, you know, we have NFL. So that's, that's why I asked that. And obviously local sports in your community, but it is like, there's a lot of other things they're competing against now, even more so than two years ago. Absolutely. And, and especially as you mentioned with the season being pushed back, you know, a late start, you know, us CFL fans, we'd commonly be seeing, you know, is it June yet trending as a hashtag leading up to the start of the season when the season doesn't start till, you know, August, that's lining up with the exact same time that NFL preseason is getting underway. Um, at the same time, uh, as you mentioned, you know, NHL, NBA, uh, World Series just wrapped up. Uh, so we're also, you know, competing with those other major sports that with the CFL being the, the league that it is, perhaps is struggling to get new fans or draw new fans in uh, when you've got these other leagues that have arguably some more exciting times in them. That's not to say the CFL isn't exciting by any means, but, you know, it's going to be interesting as we, as we reach now a new time where we're starting to talk about playoff football in the CFL, you know, the great cup happening in the middle of December. Uh, that's a very unique situation. Uh, and it's going to be interesting to see even just viewership for, for that great cup, how that's going to compare to years past with it being coming much later uh, in the year. Yeah, I mean, I we've been tracking ticket sales seem okay. Uh, we we got ours. I was like afraid that we weren't gonna, you know, because I had heard all this, and so you know, we got one of those codes, and now I look, you know, we could still have gotten, you know, nosebleed, but it does seem like tickets are moving. But I, you know, I heard, it, and I went back and forth uh, last night online too. You know, I hear okay when the playoffs hit, then it's really gonna they're really gonna go. And I go, yeah, but I heard that in after Labor Day, and I know that the timelines are weird, but I kept hearing that. Okay, after Labor Day, it's really going to get going after Labor Day. You know, now we're at week 14. Does, does Winnipeg, who are they playing this weekend? You know, Winnipeg, Alouettes, if they're in the playoffs in three weeks, does that make it a more competitive game than it will be this weekend? Like, I just don't know. It, it's interesting because I was actually talking uh, about, uh, about this uh, with a colleague of mine. I don't think we've ever seen a West Division um, I guess early pre- like season champ crowned this early in the season. It's a shortened season, and the fact that we were talking about the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, uh, you know, hosting the West Final as early as we were, uh, was very surprising. It just goes to show. I mean, they're ten and one right now. I it was funny at the start of the season we were placing bets on would there even be a team that got to double digit wins this, in this shortened season. Um, but I think. In the case of the Owls, I mean, this week they're going into a game where, you know, if they win, they clinch, um, you know, they're, they're talking about playoffs. Um, and I think as the season goes on, as those playoff picture becomes more and more tight, you know, the, the drama gets heightened, those games become more physical. You start to see it from the players as well because they know what's on the line. Um, those games become far more exciting. And to be honest, at times those, those last one or two games for each team in the regular season can be far more dramatic than, than those playoff games leading up to the great cup. Uh, well, that's good. I mean, cause I, you know, I, I'm open to have, you know, my opinion be sweet, but it does just seem like it's been, it's been a little bit, yeah, I want to talk about the lions specifically, right? I mean, that that's our team here. Um, their inability, it seems like, to win any game at all. I mean, really, in in it's been months, right? You know, uh, I want to know before I sway anything. What did you make of the Argos overtime win? You know, with BC this last weekend. You know what? I think the it, it's easy to point the blame at the kicking game, and that's the answer right there. To be honest. Uh, when you have a kicker that's struggling as much as Jimmy Camacho has been, uh, especially just the last two weeks, I mean, he has only had four kick attempts in those, those two weeks and he has not made one. Um, that's his job to be making those kicks at the same time. I think as you start to peel back the layers on this team and where they've been at, uh, the last you know five, five games, um, you start to really see perhaps what what the real issues are um you start you look at the start of the season you've got michael riley who you know he's a mop quarterback in this league he's you know consistently been among the top in terms of passing yards uh year after year 
and he starts the season and he, and he looks great. You know, this team is talking about, you know, I remember doing a story about this team and the fact that there was, there was no run game. It was non-existent, but it didn't need to be existent because they were doing so well through the air. And then they hit Winnipeg. Right. And it, it, it seemed like that first game, you know, yeah, they had, you know, a few losses before that, but it seemed like that first game against Winnipeg was, was really the big test for them leading in into that game. They had back-to-back games against Ottawa, um, which what they're just, they're, they're not a good team this year <laughs> in it being the red blacks. Um, and at the same time, you know, they, you know, they struggled against Edmonton as well. Um, and those being two of the bottom, you know, basement dwelling teams in this league, um, it's interesting because you look at Michael Riley the last few weeks, I don't think he's passed for more than 60% of his completed 60% of his passes. That's a big issue with this team. That's, that's not an issue with receivers dropping the ball. That's not an issue with, you know, you know, running the wrong routes or anything. That's an issue that falls on Michael Riley, but at the same time, also those five guys in front of him, he's, he's just getting hit way too much. And he's, he's not a young guy. So, like, you, you need to be protecting a quarterback like that. He's a beautiful man. You need to be protecting him. Make sure he's looking good. It just, it, it feels, it, you know, I've grown up in Seattle. It feels very Seahawks-esque where it's, like, hot start to the season, right? <laughs> like, Russell's, you know, MVP, Russell, and we're getting all this. And then, yeah, like I mean, this season, get out of here. But, you know, most seasons, it's like, you know, uh, they we sputter to the end. It, and that was the thing, too, was, uh, and I want to get you know, the timeout call question from you too with Coach Dinwiddie, but like the two point conversion at the end, like I'm watching this and like it's not even close, right? He's like 10 mm-hmm. yards off from hitting the. Re- I'm like, well, this isn't, this wasn't even like, okay, we did the overtime and we drove the field and we came down and we got the touchdown and then we're getting the two point conversion. Oh, wow. there you go. It wasn't even close. It was, and so that's where I get frustrated uh, as a fan and, and as someone that likes Michael Riley, you know, watching that. A hundred percent. And that's, and that's a ball that he's, he should be making consistently. I mean, that, that out route in the CFL is a completely different throw compared to that out route in the national football league or any, even in NCAA, just with the, the field dimensions. But that's a ball that he completes day after day in practice. Uh, that's a ball he needs to be making. And then especially a quarterback with, with the experience that he has, uh, in, in that given situation, overtime, game on the line, you know, you make that, you know, you win the game sort of thing. You need to be making that pass. Um, but yeah, it's, it's easy. Like I said, it's easy to point the blame on if that game particular to be pointing the blame on Jimmy Camacho uh, because, you know, he makes one of those last kicks and suddenly now they're ahead by one, right? Um, you're not having to... It, Thank goodness for the Rouge in the CFL, because if it weren't for that, I think he wouldn't have even been on the plane back to Vancouver. So, <laughs> uh, But I mean, does it, does it say something that a head coach, and I know a new head coach, but a head coach, you know, mistiming the game so poorly there at the end is what led, because I, you know, I'm working a wedding, right? Like we're there Saturday, I'm working, yeah. I'm keeping the, I'm like, okay, there's a minute left. We have downtime. I'm pulling up my phone and I watch the missed kick. And I, they're like, oh, you know, Argo's going into victory formation, you know, and I, I'm like, you know, oh, poop. And I close my phone off, right? And the next thing you know, it's like, okay, BC's going to overtime. I get the alert. I'm like, what happened here? And the fact that, like, that people were talking that this is, like, the most exciting ending in weeks, and that's how it came about. I mean, thoughts about that? And, and how does that come about? If you're a Lions fan, it wasn't exciting, yeah. right? And, and I think the other thing is, I mean, Rick Campbell, he's – He's a, I don't know if you can really say that this is his first year because he was brought in, uh, you know, when the pandemic all kind of unraveled, he's had that time to kind of familiarize himself with, with his personnel and build this team, much like any other team in this league. They, as long as you, you made the most of that, that year off to build the roster that you thought was going to bring you a great cup when you finally did step onto the field, um, You know, there's nothing to really be worried about, but for Rick Campbell to come in, you know, he spent that time, they, you know, with Michael Riley, you know, the whole focus of him coming in was, was initially was tailored around, you know, them improving that offensive line. 
And it seemed early in the season, it looked good, but it's very quickly kind of spiraled down as we've gotten to the point where they're playing those competitive teams early in the season. Let's remember that they were also facing teams that right now are in a similar position than they are. They're sitting at the bottom of the standings, you know, Edmonton and Ottawa, they have no chance of making the playoffs, but like those were games that it, it, it would have been interesting to see had they not played those back-to-back games against Ottawa, had those games perhaps spaced out where this team would be rather than, you know, beating up on Ottawa, you know, yeah putting all your time and energy into those, those wins and then having to, you know, fall face first against, against Winnipeg, you know, the way you did. Uh, so yeah, I meant that. And then also the fact that Ar- Argos basically forgot that BC had an extra timeout. Right. And that's kind of what, mm-hmm. what let that, cause that to me was like, how did they not, and I think Coach Dinwiddie like came out and said he apologized, right. Or felt thankful that they had the win. I, I have some quotes in the show. But I'm like, I, I get, I get that, you know, m- clock mismanagement happens. You'll look at Mike McCarthy with the Dallas Cowboys, but like the fact that yeah. we're forgetting, you know, in a playoff clinching victory that, that the opposing team had a timeout. We go into victory formation too early. They're able to get the ball back and damn near win just on a kick. I mean, the whole thing to me just felt like kind of a kerfuffle that I don't know if that's the best look for everybody. It, it, when, I mean, I, I guess from, from someone, like you perhaps growing up, you know, you growing up in, in the States, this is a league that I, I don't know how long you've been paying attention to it for, but I guess like you're, you're trying to get, sell the league on, you know, gaining more American fans. Cause I think it is truly an, an amazing league to be uh, interested in. Um, and when you see those types of decisions, you almost question like, how is this a professional league when you're, when you're, you know, the scoreboard's right there. You know, you, you can see how many timeouts each team has. You can see where the ball is. You can see how much time is on the clock. Like th- those are all things that are readily available. They're right there in front of you. And it, it's not even like they're in your, in your lap. They're right there. Um, so it is, it is a little bit concerning. Um, I mean, Ryan Dinwiddie, he, this is his, you know, first year with the Argos for Campbell. You could say this is his first, like first yeah. full season with the Lions and, it, it can be questionable when you're seeing these types of decisions being made in very meaningful games, um, have them play out. At the same time, for Rick Campbell, he almost, it was a monkey pitch. All you had to do was hit it out of the park. You know, not even, you just needed, it, it's tough because I think, you want to also trust your kicker as well at the end of the day. That's what he practices day in, day out. I mean, just put it through the uprights. And for Jimmy Tomacho to not have done that at all that game, uh, it definitely, it, it puts a target on his back. It puts a target on Rick Campbell's back because it's, well, why, why'd you trust him? Why did you, put him in that position. Um, and I mean, for the Lions to have already gone ahead, I think they brought in Nick Vogel this week uh, ahead of Hamilton. Um, it just goes to show they're, they're looking for answers. They're looking to correct their mistakes because I do think that there is, there is time. It's going to be tight. There is still time though uh, for them to potentially make the playoffs. Yeah, I was just, I was like, I knew it was Vogel. I couldn't remember if it was Nathan or, yeah, Nick Vogel. Uh, well, we had Paul McCallum on last week, and one of our listeners said, maybe you should see if Paul wants to, you know, like, lace back on the, the, the you know, cleats and go. I, so, last question for you. You know, as we, you know, you've worked for Hamilton, right? You know, BC going in. What, I, I'm really curious to see uh, that, your thoughts on that. And what, what do you make of that matchup, right? I mean, Mazzoli, my fantasy wishes I would have picked him last week. I mean, who knew that he's having this? It's a weird season, right? I mean, talk to me about, I guess, first. Talk to me about that. You know, Mazzoli struggles, Dane Evans, Dane's hurt, and now Mazzoli is, like, playing godlike, you know, football. So, I guess, first, let's talk about that. And, and that's interesting because I remember the year that I was with the Hamilton Tire Cats, it was the year that Zach Caleros was with the starting quarterback. Um, there was a lot of questions around Zach coming into the season with regards to, like, injuries and everything. Um, and yeah, it was, it just seemed like that from that season to the next, you saw that, that shift from Zach Caleros to Jeremiah Masoli. 
Uh, that same year that I was with the Tirecast, that was when Jeremiah had that amazing comeback in Edmonton. Um, and it, it was a, truly a dramatic because I didn't think we were going to come back. And I say we having worked for the team, but like didn't think that we were going to come back or have any chance in that game against Edmonton. Um, but now moving forward, you almost fu- you you kind of found yourself in a very similar situation because coming into the season, you had Jeremiah Soli, he was, you know, already having those MOP conversations before even hitting the field in well over a year. Um, but then at the same time, you also had Dane Evans, you know, you know, right, right there behind him. Uh, it's, it has been a very interesting, unique season because there has been so many storylines from team to team with Edmonton, it just so happens, or Hamilton rather, it just so happens to be that topic of of who's playing at quarterback when you've got Jeremiah Masoli, then you've got Dane Evans, and then you know both fall down to injury, um, and then you give you know Masoli back in the in the starting position, and he's playing lights out football. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how the final few weeks play out for Hamilton in a year that they're hosting the great cup for the first time since 1999. Well, yeah. And heaven forbid they get it two out of three years because I mean, I saw like all, I was like, you know, I was like, that kind of, kind of makes sense. I'm just, uh, so, I mean, uh, I mean, I, I feel like lions are walking into the slaughterhouse here just with how, especially how good Hamilton looked last week. I mean, I'll be it against Edmonton, but uh, final thoughts on that game before we let you go. And that's the thing. I think this is the game that, you, you automatically, perhaps many, many analysts, many fans across the league, you automatically give, you know, the, the up to Hamilton. Um, that being said, I think this is the game. This is a statement game that BC could go into Hamilton and Michael Riley goes off for 300 yards, right? If you have that performance out of Michael Riley, you have that protection from your offensive line. And I don't know who, I don't think the word has actually been released as to whether they've released Jimmy Camacho or what's going on in terms of Camacho and Nick Vogel. But if you get your kicker to actually make a field goal this, this week, then I think that it's it last week was a good bounce back from a 45, nothing score against Winnipeg to at least be in a competitive game against the team that was undefeated at home still is um that was a good performance that was a good way to bounce back it's unfortunate that it it panned out the way that it did um but in hamilton it's going to be tough and it's i know how tough that stadium can be for for kickers so if it's Kamacho, you've got a rebound from last week if it's nick lolo you're coming into a new league a stadium that you've got you've got a twister that's basically just always over top of that stadium and you've got to figure that out. Uh, it's going to be a tough game for for the kicker, who, regardless of who's playing in that game. But I do think that if if BC is able to pull out a win, and it, it needs to be a win, but if they are able to pull out a win in that, then I, I think they're in a good position for the rest of the season. Because you know, yeah, you, you I think your last game of the season is against against Edmonton and and that sh- that should be a good game. I'll I, I I'm gonna bite my tongue right now, but as long as you're you're in the win column leading into that game, uh those final few weeks, then I think you're positioning yourself well to at least be competitive and and vying for a playoff spot. Yeah, it's per Matt Baker, he's in COVID right now or COVID you know protocol right now. So I, I feel like we're gonna be stuck with it for another week. It's just frustrating this year because we had the global kicker right the first two, I'm I was trying to uh do you remember? I was trying to recall in the back. I, I looked it. I looked it up last last night because I was like, "Oh yeah, we, we we did have that that other kicker from from Japan, I believe, uh, early in the season." And yeah, kicking has been a struggle for the Lions all this year. Uh, Kamacho came in and he he looked good in his first few games. Um, the last few weeks, he is he has not looked good whatsoever. So. He, he, you just, you need to jump back on that, that train of focus and just zero in, like, don't worry about, don't worry about the stadium lights. Don't worry about, you know, the fans. Don't worry about the situation. Don't worry about the standings. You've got one job and it's football through the uprights. 
I say that having never <laughs> been a kicker myself, but it's that's your job. You just got to focus on that. You got to remember that that's that's what you're 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 getting paid to do. Yeah, Takiro Yamasaki. There you go. There you go. <laughs> uh, well, uh, Ethan, I appreciate your time today. I, I will, you know, with bated breath, be watching this game here. But yeah, it's I, it's scary times ahead. But I, I, I do appreciate it, and uh, well, hopefully, we have the last couple good weeks of the season. But yeah, I don't feel good for BC, but I feel good for uh, my <laughs> wife, who uh, you know, the first night of the season picked Winnipeg and has never looked back. And you know, we can't all be so lucky. So uh, thanks yeah, again. Go. Thanks again for your time. I appreciate it. <laughs> No, I appreciate it. Take care. Welcome back. I want to thank all of our esteemed guests. I won't even try to pronounce Mr. Salikas. 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 Uh, yeah, we want to thank all of our guests for joining us. Reed. Yep. Good Sh- work. Sean Bowen was great. And then we had Simon and then obviously Ethan. Ray. Ethan, I, I, I think it was good. I, I was happy with all that. So thank you guys all so much for making the time. We have a really good show next week as well. I have scheduled. Um, so uh, one note, PJ Walker is apparently slated uh, XFL um, you know, legend PJ Walker to play this week that uh, Sam Darnold is still in concussion protocol. So PJ could be getting the start uh, for Carolina. Couldn't, couldn't and, hurt their chances right now. And, and if he, if he takes, if he, if he gets that W, then Arash needs to apologize once again, once again. Well, last week when it was, cause PJ got to play, Josh Johnson got to play. And then, um, Heineke got to play, but like they, cause I was going to tweet like F you Arash, whatever. Then like Josh Johnson only played like one down and then PJ lost a bunch of yards. I was like, okay, I'm not going to tweet anything this week. Cause I was, I was going back. Oh, all three quarterbacks leading their teams. And then he would have been like, yeah, to losses. <laughs> right. Um, the, 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 the we talked about this briefly. You you got the National Spring Football a trademark. It's gonna be interesting to see what happens with that. Yeah, I'm gonna put this tweet up here from listener Seth. Uh, just you know, get, going off of uh, when Aaron Rodgers got uh, sacked uh, against uh, was it against the Cardinals, and, and that was the big funny thing. I thought Seth was good with that. Uh, I will say that. So guys, for the USFL stuff, I really want some comments on the YouTube video because what I'm trying to figure out, we're talking about the identity crisis of the USFL because I got into a lot of uh, Facebook discussions this week where people are like. Because it's kind of people are realizing now, like it's going to be eight teams, it's going to be a bubble. It's called the USFL, and I got a lot of like, well, this is like dumb. This isn't what I wanted, or this isn't what I expected, or this isn't. And so, like, are you excited by this? I mean, I it's good for the listenership to have people think it's something that it's not right because people are interested and they're tuning in. But like, I genuinely want to know, like, are you really jazzed about this? Uh, it, there's been talks that they're going to do a draft. I, I can't imagine it's going to be a televised thing. Does that make it more exciting if it is a televised draft? I really want to hear from people if they're actually excited now that we know what this USFL thing is going to be. Uh, yeah. With that being said, uh, Fox sports is apparently holding a formal announcement next week. Uh, detailing the USFL is coming to Birmingham. Yeah, so uh, per Dylan Smith, this came out. Uh, the the Senate, you know, they passed the funding. Uh, we I have the article here. I copy. Uh, they approved. So they basically they've hit the three million that the city needed to kind of bring to the table uh, because they're you know the way the the deal is working is kind of the USFL is going to be hosted there. Um, they, they, I just had a couple notes here. They think that they're going to have 40 million people watching the games played at the brand new stadium. Uh, he says it's great exposure. Crystal Smitherman, uh, counselor said, uh, we don't owe Fox sports any money. I think that's really significant because usually we have to pay the league's money to come here. So that 3 million is kind of like housing, all of those costs and things. Uh, the interesting thing, uh, one of our listeners, Harrison sent this over, uh, the, uh Fox sports personalities and officials have suggested they would like to get involved in the community. Their wall. They're in Birmingham doing internships with broadcasting, doing community service, doing training camps with the kids. I think that's a really cool way to like build that community growth. Again, I don't know how that affects like viewership in San Diego, like why you're supposed to watch this USFL Birmingham thing. Do you get why it's like this identity crisis? Why I titled the episode that? Yeah, I, I just uh, I don't know. Like on top of like on top of the fact that we still have so many unanswered questions behind who owns what like there's still so many questions to me i don't think the people that own these trademarks can own them i still don't well we we know who owns one trademark <laughs> yeah that's for sure um, and we know that frank murtha owns major league football incorporated maybe he owns it maybe he doesn't maybe he's part of the ownership i don't know i don't frank know Murtha owns it. but they they announced that there's uh there's some cities under consideration 
for their six franchises in their initial run. Mobile, Montgomery, Alabama, Little Rock, Little Rock, Arkansas, Norfolk, uh, Canton, Daytona, Orlando, Austin, Denton, Texas, San Antonio, Texas, and uh, Oklahoma City. We don't talk about Oklahoma City. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, people, it's, this is one of those other spring leagues that, that, that they're claiming to be launching in mid April. Uh, you know, they were going to come in in the summer. We had a lot of questions about that. It's just another one of those crowding the landscape. Also, the FCF, they've kind of posted, I'm going to put the tweet on here. Yep. They're going to be coming in spring as well. So, you know, we're further kind of delaying that. It was supposed to be in the fall. We thought maybe February. Okay, now it's going to be in the spring. Uh, this is a really crowded landscape. You know, that's when indoor football league kicks off and arena football. And then you're going to have our, probably not arena football, but you know, the IFL. And then you're going to have, um, the USFL, right? Uh, getting a lot of these players. I do not think this MLFB thing is going to be good. Um, RIP Josh Davis was actually really close friends with Frank Murtha that kind of would give us a lot of insights, but Josh always ne- never really thought that it was going to go anywhere, but it's a really crowded landscape with uh fan football coming in as well, which apparently in the, is, what, is that Timothy Chalamet? What is that tweet? Uh, that's Timothy Chalamet. And then uh, Zendaya is next to him. Cause you know, it's like the Dune thing. You see Dune yet? I haven't seen Dune yet. I did, remember I sent you that thing with friends. How you doing? <laughs> it was it was Joey with all the Dune stuff. Oh. Anyway, so uh, but here's the long of the short. USFL should be the week of the fifteenth, potentially next week. Uh, Dylan is reporting our friend there with Birmingham. We've had him on before. It's all good to go. Uh, but I really want to know what people are thinking. Like, are we actually jazzed about this now or not? Now that we like people that are learning about this, if you're learning about the USFL now, like, are we game for this? Or are we not game for this? Uh, I think we're all still waiting for the XFL to give us something more than what they're giving us. So, um, with that being said, uh, want to thank everybody for listening. Um, thanks to our guest. I'll let Reed say, I completely lost control of the Google docs. So you can say their names. I can't get back up there to say it. Uh, they, they sing in Sean Bowen with Tor- Toronto Argonauts. We have uh, Simon Staliki. I keep, I, it's Staliki. I keep saying it wrong. And then uh, Ethan Reddy. Thank you guys all so much. Good show next week. And uh, hopefully we'll have a big USFL announcement. So Yeah, let's, let's look forward to that. And uh, again, uh, please like and review and share the video too. Why not? Share the video as well. And we appreciate all your listeners, all your views. And we'll see you back here next week. Thanks.